Hello everyone, today we're continuing our deep dive of Richard Dawkins and Yan Wong's book, The Ancestor's Tale. In this episode, we're going to discuss molecular clocks in relation to the Cambrian explosion. So, let's jump right in. We've talked about the Cambrian Explosion a lot on this channel. We did the Cambrian Explosion, Parts 1 and 2, Darwin's Confidence, Parts 1 and 2, Our Precambrian Ancestors. I also appeared on Vice Rhino's channel to debunk Deflate's talking points about the Cambrian. I co-authored Professor Dave's videos refuting Stephen Meyer and Gunter Beckley on the Cambrian Explosion. And RJ Downard and I have a long section on the Cambrian in our forthcoming book, The Rocks Were There, Volume 2. Suffice it to say, if you want to know about the Cambrian period and why it portrays evolutionary trends just like every other geologic age, watch any of those videos. The Cambrian period, which as of the 2024 International Commission on Stratigraphy, lasted from 538 to 486 million years ago. It is famous among even the laymen and has occupied the minds of paleontologists and biologists because it represented an enigma. When Darwin first penned On the Origin of Species in 1859, he made reference to the supposedly sudden appearance of trilobites in the Silurian, which seemed at odds with what evolutionary theory predicts. Although with the benefit of hindsight, that shouldn't have been all that disturbing, because trilobites were among the earliest widespread groups with very mineralized body parts, which fossilized more easily than soft-bodied organisms. By the publication of the 6th edition in 1872, the geologic strata Darwin was observing was redefined to the Cambrian, and over the last century and a half, the mystery of the Precambrian has slowly dissolved. Understand that Precambrian is the informal geologic name referring to the time before the Cambrian, thus from 4.5 billion to 538 million years ago, some 88% of Earth's history. For a long time, no fossils were known from the Precambrian, and even when fossils were found, they were either microbial or of uncertain affinities. The question facing paleontologists and biologists was, when did the clades containing our modern organisms originate? Paleontologists would answer the question from the perspective of fossils. To take an example, let's look to the velvet worms. Velvet worms are contained within the phylum Onychophora and they are tiny, soft-bodied, many-legged animals. Modern species are found in Central and South America, the Caribbean, Africa, New Guinea, and Australia, and they used to be present in the Northern Hemisphere as well. As you may be familiar, all animals originally inhabited the ocean with many groups evolving to be terrestrial independently. Onychophorans are no exception. However, Onychophora is the only animal phyla with extant members that are exclusively terrestrial. All aquatic Onychophora species became extinct. There are two extant families, Parapatidae and Parapatopsidae. A feature uniting these families is their slime glands. Onychophorans shoot slime both to capture prey and to defend against predators. And fascinatingly, in 2024, a team of researchers made an adhesive robotic system which can perform surgical tumor removal that was inspired by Onychophoran slime. Prior to the advent of DNA sequencing technology, biologists tended to think that velvet worms represented an intermediate between annelids, or the segmented worms, and arthropods. However, genetics blew apart this hypothesis. Annelids are more closely related to mollusks, and both are only very distantly related to velvet worms, arthropods, and tardigrades, with these latter three forming the clade Panarthropoda. As mentioned in the brine shrimp's tale, the exact topology of Panarthropoda is controversial. It is not known which two phyla are sisters, with the third as the outgroup. This is largely due to incomplete lineage sorting, a process we explained in the bonobo's tale. Additionally, the three phyla appear to have separated so closely in time to each other, such that their fossil relatives near the split all look very similar to each other. 
a few fossils from Cenozoic amber called Terciopatus and Suxinopitopsis were initially described as onychophorans, but a 2016 paper finds this assignment unlikely. One crown onychophoran called Credoperipatus is known from the late Cretaceous, and Antinopatus from the late Carboniferous is likely a highly derived terrestrial stem onychophoran. When onychophorans made the switch from an aquatic life to a terrestrial one, though, is unknown. Previously, Helenodora from the late Carboniferous, about 311 to 307 million years ago, was thought to be an aquatic stem velvet worm, but that 2016 paper argued it is instead a lobopod of uncertain affinities, one of those walking worms we met in the brine shrimp's tail. As we discussed then, lobopods are a paraphyletic assemblage of early panarthropods that gave rise to the onychophorans, tardigrades, and arthropods. They look like just a tube with legs, each bearing claws, and as a result of their broad similarities, their systematics have been contentious. Probably the most famous lobopod is Hallucigenia from the 508 million year old Burgess Shale. Initially reconstructed upside down as having spiky legs and dorsal tentacles, the discovery of more complete specimens revealed that the animal had instead dorsal spines with the tentacle-like limbs. Based on the presence of stacked elements and sclerites of claws and dorsal spines, Hallucigenia has been traditionally identified as a stem onychophoran. However, a 2023 paper by Ji Hoon Kim et al. has instead argued that Hallucigenia should be considered a stem panarthropod. The reason the researchers point out is that morphology based phylogenetic analyses of lobopods have not focused on tardigrade morphology including only a handful of tardigrade species at most. When tardigrade morphology was more rigorously interrogated, Hallucigenia was recovered as more basal, having diverged prior to the extant panarthropod phyla. Furthermore, the Lobopodian order, Luolichaniida, was found to be a group of stem tardigrades. Luolichaniida is an odd group of lobopods. Luolichania and Calincium are less derived and look more like other lobopods. Luolachania has five pairs of elongated anterior appendages covered with setae and nine pairs of walking appendages. There is a progressive trend towards a reduction in walking appendages and an elongation of the anterior appendages. In the more derived Ovadio vermis, it possesses just three pairs of reduced walking appendages, and the highly derived Fasivermis lacks walking appendages altogether. Fasivermis appears to have been extremely adapted for a tube-dwelling, suspension-feeding lifestyle, an ecology highly atypical for lobopods. Since some lobopods were ancestral to velvet worms, velvet worms get the tail. With our background knowledge of the onychophoran fossil record, we can now ask, when exactly did velvet worms split from the other panarthropods? Lobopods show up in the fossil record around the end of Cambrian Stage 2, or the start of Cambrian Stage 3 approximately 521 million years ago. If lobopods are indeed ancestral to panarthropods, then the existence of arthropod trace fossils dating to 537 million years ago, such as Cruziana, must mean that panarthropods were already in existence. As mentioned in the brine shrimp's tale, Yelingia from the Ediacaran is a possible panarthropod, but this assignment is contentious. However, the recent discovery of Uncus zaugizi dating to 560 to 550 million years ago, shows that ectisozoans were already diversifying in the Ediacaran. Given how far back in time the panarthropod split took place and the haphazard nature of fossil preservation, especially for small, soft-bodied organisms, it is not especially surprising that the fossil record can only give us hints, not a definitive answer, to our question. We must then turn to a separate line of evidence. Genetics. Remember from the chimpanzee's tale that the genome can be used like a biological timer. Mutations accrue and are fixed into the genome at particular rates. This information can be used to build evolutionary histories of clades. To do this, one must compare the number of mutational differences between two genetic sequences, one homologous sequence from two species, and then divide that by two for two sequences. If there are a total of 10 differences between two sequences, then each sequence has an average of 5 differences. 
Next, one may choose a fossil that is the closest approximation of the common ancestor between the species. For us and chimps, an example would be Sahelanthropus from 7 to 6 million years ago. We will use 6.5 million as the average. Thus, approximately five mutations fixed in each sequence in about 6.5 million years, or one mutation fixed in each sequence every 1.3 million years. The first proteins that were observed to act like molecular clocks were hemoglobin, cytochrome C, and fibrinopeptides. For the first, the number of differences between alpha hemoglobin sequences in humans and horses were found to be about 18, so an average of 9 mutations in each sequence. At the time, the best paleontological evidence indicated that the common ancestor of horses lived between 160 and 100 million years ago. Current genetic and genomic estimates have moved that date slightly forward to about 98 million years ago, so those researchers got pretty close. So dividing those dates by 9 gives us 18 to 11, average 14.5 million years per fixation. With our 14.5 million years per fixation figure, we can use that number to date the divergences between hemoglobin alpha, beta, gamma, and delta sequences, which Emil Zuckerkandel and Linus Pauling did. What they found was that the fixation rate appears pretty linear over time, the first molecular clock. Alpha is the most different from all the other sequences, meaning it diverged from the others the furthest back in time. Next, beta and gamma diverged. And lastly, beta and delta diverged most recently. This conclusion has been upheld in recent years. Following the hemoglobin chains, cytochrome C was found to have a slower evolutionary rate than hemoglobin, whereas fibrinopeptides have a faster rate. What's neat about this is that if one knows the rate at which each gene mutates, then one could use multiple genes as cross-checks. The next important development came with the formulation of the neutral theory of molecular evolution. There can be a difference between the rate of mutations occurring, the mutation rate, and the rate of those mutations becoming fixed in the population, the fixation rate. The former will be far higher than the latter under conditions of natural selection because it takes less time for mutations to crop up than for those mutations to spread through a population via selection. However, if a mutation is neutral, then the mutation rate equals the fixation rate, which is extremely convenient for molecular clocks. With regard to neutral mutations, the number of generations needed for that mutation to reach fixation is 4n sub e, where n sub e is the effective population size or the number of individuals capable of breeding. Of course, life is rarely simple. There are a variety of complicating factors in molecular clocks. The first we've already encountered. Different clocks tick at different rates. We cannot simply assume that if one gene mutates at a constant rate, then that rate is identical across genes. One proposal to explain this discrepancy is that the more neutral sites in a gene, the faster it can accrue mutations. After all, if deleterious mutations are more likely to arise than beneficial mutations, then selection will discourage those mutations from spreading, preserving that section of the genome. Therefore, quote, the rate of gene evolution is governed by the overall mutation rate and the proportion of sites at which changes are neutral. Mutation rates are clearly different across lineages. For example, the RNA polymerase and reverse transcriptase of RNA viruses are extremely error-prone, leading to very rapid evolution. The rate of evolution in HIV is about a million times faster than the rate for mammals. Rates can vary within clades too. The rate of evolution for murid rodents, e.g. mice, rats, and hamsters, is higher than in great apes. This rate can even vary between nuclear and mitochondrial genes. Mammalian mitochondrial DNA polymerase has a higher error rate than other DNA polymerases, leading to faster evolution in mitochondrial DNA. Further lab experiments have shown that bacteria can develop mutator alleles that raise the mutation rate because they increase the chance of attaining a beneficial mutation. However, this also increases the chance of developing a deleterious mutation. Bacteria with the mutator alleles are then placed under selection to develop a mutation rate that balances the cropping up of mutations with their repair. And life history traits can also influence rates of evolution. 
warm-blooded animals, such as the birds and mammals, have higher substitution rates than cold-blooded animals because more free radicals are produced by warm-blooded animals' higher metabolic rate. This also applies to smaller mammals that have higher metabolic rates than larger mammals. Another complication is that population size plays a role in the fixation of mutations. Understand that population genetics predicts that mutations can become fixed in a population more easily if the population is smaller. So, if a population drastically reduces in size, then this could lead to multiple mutations becoming fixed nearly simultaneously. To deal with possible sources of error, scientists put error bars on their estimates to indicate uncertainty. If the error bars for samples millions of years old are plus or minus a few thousands or a few tens of thousands of years, then that's pretty good. However, if the error bars are plus or minus hundreds of millions of years, then determining when a common ancestor lived can be problematic. For example, estimates for the common ancestor of humans and fungi have ranged from 900 million years to around 1.7 billion years because we have no fossils to anchor the split. For a group with a fossil record, though, we can be reasonably confident in the common ancestry dates provided by molecular clocks. Since we do in fact have fossils to anchor the split between onychophorans and arthropods, a 2017 paper by Martin Dorman and Gerd Vorheide estimated that they diverged about 553 million years ago in the late Ediacaran. So that's the Velvet Worm's tale. Molecular clocks are tools used by geneticists to date splits and lineages, giving us insights into the evolutionary history of different clades. So, thanks for watching, and we'll see you all next time.